called Equinox, and we'll start this webinar in which we're going to discuss smart ventilation uh, along with details of ERVs and HRVs for maintaining uh, healthy uh, indoor air quality in, inside residences. Uh, I'm speaking to you from Urbana, Illinois, uh, the middle of nowhere, about 120 miles south of Chicago, about 120 miles west of Indianapolis, and maybe 150, 160 miles northeast of St. Louis. So that's about where we're located. Uh, Urbana and Champaign are twin cities that are uh, the home of the University of Illinois, where uh, Ben Newell, Alex Long, and myself uh, all have roots. Um, and uh, so just give you a little idea of who we are and where we are. So let's, let's get started. Um, thank you very much for attending this webinar. Please send in uh, as many questions as you have. This is the first time we're running this seminar and we'd appreciate information that helps us improve it as well. So uh, please give us feedback. What, uh, what was most useful? What wasn't useful? How can we improve this? As well as your questions about any of the materials. And uh, Ben and Alex are standing by to answer questions uh, in text as, as often as they can. And for any of those questions that are unanswered, uh, we'll take the list and we will respond and get a list of answers out uh, to folks on those things. So uh, for sure we want to encourage uh, dialogue and, and discussion on, on these topics. Um, Here's a picture of us. I'm the old guy as uh, maybe match up between the picture and if you do have the camera image showing on your screen. Ben uh, is president of Build Equinox and Newell Instruments, our parent company, and Alex Long is vice president. The three of us are mechanical engineers and uh, with a variety of backgrounds within that from uh, mechanical design to thermal systems, fluid mechanics and thermodynamics, and uh, electronics and controls. I just wanted to mention our motivation overall. How do we live on a piece of land without spoiling it? Easier said than done. Basically, how do we create technologies that help us live healthier, more comfortably, but in a manner that sustains the resources that are needed for future generations. So that's, uh, that's what drives us. I'm speaking to you from our facility here in Urbana. It's a 4,500 square foot building, and it is a zero plus building. Uh, we have 5,500 watts of uh, solar PV, and that is more than enough to fully solar power uh, to make this building a net zero energy building throughout the course of the year. And, uh, and if it could be done in a building like what we're in, uh, a simple Morton metal uh, farm type building, it can be done in any building. For more detail on some of the research work we do, this page also shows a link to our Vermont report on serve operation. And I'll discuss that a little bit more in this, uh, in this discussion. So here's, here's home, central Illinois. We're fortunate to live on an acre of land surrounded by some nice prairie and some nice trees. And uh, we have um, our uh, one solar system, a 3200 watt solar tracker we call Sunflower, and then over by the south side of our building, another uh, uh, 5500 watt, uh, 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 5500 watt system. Uh, we call sundial, and all together we have about uh, 8,500 watts of solar power. Uh, our building is very well insulated, very well sealed, uh, good windows and all of those type of things. And then the primary comfort conditioning is with a geothermal heat pump that was installed in 1988. So probably one of the oldest geothermal systems, I think, in the country. Um, here's a bunch of serves coming off the line, and up at the top, shows an install serve fresh air ventilation system. And we'll talk about that some, but uh, I also wanted to let you know, this is the third in a series of webinars. We have a, another webinar that will be uh, 
presented in December that talks more specifically about the CERV and its operational characteristics. And then a third webinar that we'll present sometime again in the future on a new set of indoor air quality metrics that we've developed um, at Build Equinox that we are using to help uh, folks better understand what the air quality um, indoors means as far as their productivity, their brain health, their, uh, uh, their overall uh, uh, well feeling of well-being. And just briefly, uh, people are understanding that we have far too long neglected the value of air quality in our homes, businesses, schools, and uh, a turning point as ASHRAE with uh, President Bill Bonflet uh, made a major aspect of his platform to, to change the conversation so we're talking about truly healthy and productive environments, not ones that are just satisfactory. And uh, below that picture, you can see our Equinox house, which is not only my house and is also a zero plus uh, solar powered home, but, but also our testbed platform. Uh, we built this house in 2010. Since that time, it has supplied over 10,000 kilowatt hours excess into the grid, as well as powers, economically powers two electric vehicles, Ford Focus EV and, uh, and a C-Max plug-in electric. High performance homes, uh, just a little bit on energy. This is really about air quality and different ways that we can obtain good air quality. But we have to talk about energy because maintaining good air quality does require some energy. This plot, which you'll find in our Vermont report, the report we wrote for Efficiency Vermont, studied 13 homes with CERV fresh air units in it, smart uh, ventilation systems. And you see a cloud of data. Uh, so these are 13 identical homes, but of course the people living in them are not identical. And, and this is why uh, uh, it's so difficult to, to study the energy consumption in a home. You need a lot of homes in order to, to figure out what's going on with the folks inside. But the open circles that you see, those are conventional homes, well-built, modern homes, built since the year 2000. Uh, these are uh, what you would consider nice homes. Uh, and, uh, and you can see that their energy consumption, as the temperature gets colder, as the temperature gets warmer, exceeds that of the Vermont homes. And this, oh, the square showing on that, uh, those are Equinox House and exceeds Equinox House by, by quite a margin. A typical conventional home would use about 20,000 to 30,000 kilowatt hours, whether it's all electric or electric gas combined. But as far as the energy content, energy intensity, that would be its usage. And throughout most of the US, this would maybe be a $2,000, $3,000 utility bill. These high performance homes are substantially lower in energy. Uh, in order to maintain good comfort and to do the things we like to do in our homes, you're not going to have zero energy, but there's no reason to. We can afford the amount of energy needed to run our TVs and our computers and cook the foods we like and to take a nice hot shower. Um, we can do that sustainably with solar energy. What we define as a high performance home is something that uses less than 10,000 kilowatt hours a year. And this new generation of homes that, that uh, we're involved in projects from one end of the country to another, these are regularly using way less than 10,000 kilowatt hours per year. 4,000 to 8,000 is probably typical. And this group of identical homes in Vermont, one of the harshest climates and one of the most difficult areas to meet passive house standards, say both the European Passive House Institute and then the American uh, FIAS, uh, these homes as a group exceed, uh, have lower energy usage, uh, lower by 20% than the most stringent of energy standards. And, uh, and so you can read that report to get better dissection of these energies and, and, and uh, the energy efficiency of these homes. 
But this is the power of smart ventilation, that you can have energy uh, efficiency coupled with comfort and excellent indoor air quality. At the bottom here, you see the one and two. I have a list of references at the end of this presentation. Uh, there's about 14 or 15 resident uh, references. And these are there for you to be able to see where this background information is coming from. On the history of house energy, and those of you that might have participated in other webinars might be getting tired of seeing this slide, but, but I think it's an important one. The slide I just showed between, say, modern homes of conventional construction and then this high-performance home, these are the two lower bars, 2010C for conventional, 2010S for super. On this perspective, not a lot of difference compared to that 1920s home that uh, had no insulation, had single glazed, leaky windows, and quite a bit of energy reduction from the 1950-era home, which started having some insulation and, uh, and had storm windows and other things. What has also changed over the years has our electric consumption for the things we like to do in the house. More lights, more uh, microwave oven, computers, more TVs, things that we have now that we didn't have in the past. Um, this is growing. And so the difference in energy between a conventional home and a super home is not so great on this perspective. But what is different is that the human energy consumption is at least half in many of these homes of the overall energy. And climate has become less and less significant as far as the energy impact on a home. The other important thing that's happened is that conventional homes, as we've sealed and insulated them better, coupled with that, we've seen respiratory illnesses more than double over the past 30 years. With smart ventilated homes, homes that can sense when we need fresh air, we can gain in energy efficiency while reducing um, reducing the ill effects on our health in the home. This plot shows data from the CDC and the National Center for Healthy Homes showing how asthma has increased since 1970. You can see that, uh, and from other databases that you might look at, asthma has increased from 3% incidence from, say, 1970, 80, up to more than 8% incidence. Uh, the CDC data here is for childhood asthma incidence. And uh, at the same time, you can also see that uh, we better sealed our homes. This normalized leakage, uh, the leakage in a home at typical atmospheric pressure, a blower door, ACH would be about 20 times this factor. So uh, since the 1960s, 1970s, as we built better quality homes that are better sealed, we have driven that down to very low levels of normalized leakage. And uh, at today, 2010 and beyond, we now see contractors and builders regularly constructing homes that the passive house level, which is that lower dot at 2010, with 0.6 ACH at, um, at 50 Pascal blower door, and then 3 ACH as uh, a range that, say, uh, a conscientious, high-quality contractor might build without going the further steps of additional sealing and avoiding penetrations in an envelope. So uh, now this isn't to say that Infiltration is the cause of asthma. It correlates. Uh, I can also show you that ice cream and murders correlate. Uh, I don't know that ice cream causes murder or murder causes ice cream. But we have to be careful when we say that something is correlated. Um, and, and in this case, uh, uh, we don't know that infiltration is the cause. But, but you know, we spend... 90, 93% of our time indoors. And uh, one of these references shows you the 
what I found is the most detailed survey on our activities indoors and outdoors, um, what that time consists of. But the vast majority of our indoor time is in our homes. And so I would suspect that that's one of the places we should be looking at a time when outdoor air pollution, at least in the United States, has dropped, car pollution, factory pollution, power plant pollution, these things have dropped, that uh, something within our indoor environment, the materials that we've begun using since the 1970s that uh, we haven't uh, been around before, as well as, uh, as well as not getting enough, not getting sufficient fresh air in our homes. Uh, I'd like to also comment, though, that a leaky home is not a healthy home. We survey a lot of homes. We run a lot of indoor air quality tests on conventional homes without ventilation systems. And more likely than not, their air quality is not good, even though their normalized leakage might be quite high, say 0.4 to, to 1. The reason is that where the leaks occur and where you live are two different things. Your bedroom may be quite well sealed. Your living room may not have a lot of infiltration air moving through it. That infiltration air, which has a significant energy impact on your home, may primarily be moving from the gas flue of your water heater over to the kitchen vent or to a laundry uh, uh, clothes dryer vent. And if it's not passing by you, it's not doing you any good. So let's talk a bit about HRVs and ERVs, which are the predominant means of energy recovery in today's homes with, uh, with uh, active ventilation. HRVs are commonly called heat recovery ventilators in contrast to ERVs that are often called energy or enthalpy recovery ventilators. And the main thing to distinguish them is that an ERV is made in a manner such that moisture can also be transported from the exhaust stream to the incoming stream or vice versa, depending on the weather conditions. And we'll look at some psychrometric maps to under, have a better understanding of how that occurs. The, uh, the HRV shown on the left, uh, this is a picture I took um, at a research lab in Europe. Uh, and um, and it was nice that they had this plexiglass cover over it so you could see the internals of, of this particular ERV. And, um, and what you see is an exhaust air stream that would pass through this duct, go through this corrugated heat exchanger core, and then exit through a fan and blow out. And then a fresh air stream, a stream of air from outside that would move through opposing corrugations in this heat exchanger core and then exit through this fan and go out. Now there's many configurations to this. This is just one configuration. A more efficient configuration, for example, might turn this fan around backwards. So this stream is going in a counterflow manner through the device as fresh air goes through and exhaust air is leaving. Uh, you'll find in some uh, heat recovery ventilators and, and energy recovery ventilators, a more elongated core such that uh, they're not going in such a cross flow manner over each other, which can also have another improvement in the energy recovery efficiency of the unit. But the basic aspects of an ERV or an HRV are some kind of a core to exchange energy and then moisture, if it's an ERV, and then uh, some kind of airflow system. In this case, two separate fans. Sometimes it's um, a single motor with a fan on each end of the shaft so that two fans are driven by a single motor. Sometimes the fans are external to the HRV core. Um, so there's all, all different flavors of these. The difference between an ERV and an HRV uh, here we see a, another core. This is from uh, a U.S. Uh, ERV. And you can see the corrugations here. The corrugations are opposed in 90 degrees on this. So air coming in here moves through corrugations that are underneath and above the corrugations moving in this other direction. 
but the material used in this ERV core is one that's semi-permeable to moisture and in that manner even though it's not letting the raw air go from the one side to the other uh, moisture is able to uh, diffuse through that core material. The core wall material might be something like uh, uh, paper or cellulose. The core material might be a plastic that's been made semi-permeable in some manner. Um, and so there's a, a variety of different materials that might get used in these. So uh, between the two, HRVs and ERVs, functionally they're the same thing. Uh, you can often buy a model of HRV, pull the core out, and then put an ERV core in it, and then get the moisture change in. The question is, what do you gain or what do you lose when you make that change? And we'll address that here. I just wanted to note as far as the motivation for ventilation, ASHRAE 62.2 drives most building inspection to make sure that both the overall house ventilation meets those codes for those areas that are uh, actively following um, these building ventilation codes. And then um, also uh, section four in ASHRAE, uh, section five in ASHRAE 62.2 on local ventilation, that this, uh, uh, this specifies what's needed for local exhaust in bathrooms and kitchens. And from our work, we generally see that the local exhaust drives the overall airflow amount. Um, uh, between what's needed for the kitchen as well as the number of bathrooms. Uh, but you need to follow both the overall ventilation as well as the, the, uh, the kitchen uh, bathroom local exhaust. To take a look at how, uh, how ERVs and HRVs operate with real weather and real indoor conditions, this next slide shows hourly data. This is every hour of the year for central Illinois. And I proudly proclaim us as having the worst weather in the United States, and I'll, I'll demonstrate why that is. But for us, uh, for Build Equinox, where we are actively working with various types of uh, heat pumps and air conditioning systems, it's a benefit because with this broad range of terrible weather, we get to uh, experiment and make sure that our systems are operating well in all kinds of conditions. So this is a, this is a psychrometric map uh, with a lot of the other details such as enthalpies and, uh, and air density left off of it. The basic psychrometric map is one that shows moisture content on a humidity ratio basis. And humidity ratio is just the mass of water vapor to the mass of air versus the temperature, or what we call the sensible condition. And uh, this is the dry ball temperature. And when we plot this data, so I, I took this data from uh, a weather database for 2012, which wasn't a particularly hot year, as you can see, that we didn't get above 90 degrees very often, where typically we'll get up above 100 for some hours of the year. But plotting each hour, you can see that there's a line here that the data doesn't exceed. This is 100% relative humidity, or what you might call the dew line, or others call the saturation line. But air that's over in this region beyond it, there's no more moisture absorption capability, no more ability for air to hold more water vapor in it. And so the water has to precipitate or condense out. And so any time we're over in this region, uh, those of you that uh, spend time on an ice rink have for sure seen fog conditions there, as well as fog, rain, or snow outside. But, but this is what happens. We precipitate moisture out. So generally, our air conditions follow this whole inside region. And relative humidity, while well, that's what our weather forecasters use and is maybe our common sense of weather, uh, humidity ratio is really the more absolute measurement of the amount of water in our air. And uh, two ranges of comfort conditions plotted here. Uh, this purple one showing where you, where most people would say they're comfortable if they had pants and long sleeves on. 
and then where most people would say they're comfortable with shorts and short sleeves. And, and generally, somewhere around 70 degrees, 50% uh, humidity is where, uh, where we feel quite comfortable. But depending on personal preference, we can feel pretty comfortable in a broad range. And with our weather, you can see there's many, many hours outside of this comfort range. And comfort's important. It's important not to sacrifice comfort, because in the same way as air quality, uh, air quality degrades your productivity, discomfort also degrades productivity. Let's look at a few other places. Here's Denver. Uh, what a lovely place. Low humidity, nice temperatures, uh, quite a bit of uh, temperature above and below throughout the year, but but one of the nice things is that not a lot of moisture management needed in, in Denver. The, the envelope that you can see drawn, this is Illinois weather, so in comparison Denver maybe has some hot but very low humidity, uh, which is easy to deal with. A lot of folks there will use a swamp cooler, spray a little water in, and as they spray water in, you move on a path this way that takes you up to a nice comfortable range of temperature and humidity inside your home. Burlington, Vermont, a harsh cold winter, and indeed a lot of, a lot of time spent down here but relative to our central Illinois envelope, really not too much colder than us. Uh, we have for sure seen in Vermont some conditions with serves that have gone down to minus 26 Fahrenheit. And, uh, and fortunately, we haven't seen that here in central Illinois. But by and large, uh, they don't get the heat and humidity that we get to experience in our summers. Uh, just more cold, but really not, nothing exceptionally colder than us. Miami, just the opposite, more of the heat and humidity. And then, uh, as you can see, this uh, spring and fall season, a lot of heat and humidity continuing that, that we fortunately don't have to deal with. Seattle, Washington, what lovely weather there. Uh, does get hot sometimes. It really doesn't get humid, even though we think of it as a humid climate. But they spend a lot of time over here. And the interesting thing about this air is that even though it doesn't need to be uh, cool, sometimes it needs to be dehumidified in order to keep the inside of a house comfortable. And that can present a challenge uh, with other types of conditioning systems. So uh, let's look at what happens to an HRV, and we're going to use the central Illinois weather, and just see the paths that the exhaust air takes relative to the incoming air. When we have air that's being exhausted from the house, and we assume our air is somewhere around 70 degrees temperature, and then let's just pick what in a lot of these high performance homes would be an indoor humidity, and that about 40% relative humidity. When we exhaust that home, uh, air from that home, and go through an HRV, first when it goes through that heat exchanger core, we're dropping the temperature without removing moisture. The air is getting colder and in this case I'm showing it dropping from say 70 degrees down to about 50 degrees and at about 50 degrees if it continues to get cool as we exhaust it through the core it hits the dew point and now water comes out of it. Now some HRVs are made to allow water to condense and some HRVs are designed to avoid that. Uh, it's very important that you check that if you're looking at HRVs. An HRV that's designed to allow water to condense, uh, it should have a condensation pan in it and should have a tube with access to some type of drain. Now, air that's coming in from the outside, I'm showing air coming in from at 20 degrees. And you'll notice that even though this is 100% relative humidity, the difference between uh, the moisture in 100% humid air at 20 degrees and say around 0% humidity, that uh, it's not that great of a moisture difference on the absolute basis. Um, but let's just say it's at 100% humidity moving in as it goes counter to the air being exhausted from the HRV. Because we are not adding any moisture, it's a horizontal line, any vertical movement of this 
up or down is an increase or a decrease of moisture to this air stream. So the air coming in comes in dry. Because of the uh, level of efficiency of an HRV, the air that's being exhausted won't typically make it all the way to the temperature of the inlet air and the air that's coming in, the fresh air coming in, it won't come all the way up to the temperature uh, where the exhaust air comes from. So that means you're going to be dropping in air that's typically less than comfort conditions in the home. It will be somewhere in this range. I'll also note that most HRVs and ERVs cannot tolerate any frost forming in their cores, and so they have different means to avoid that. It's very important to understand and to find out what that means is. Some HRVs will have maybe a 700-800 watt electric heater to preheat this air up to 30 degrees or so so that it is above the temperature that would freeze some of this moisture coming in. Some uh, simply shut down. Some HRVs go into a recirculation mode, which limits the amount of fresh air that you can bring in in the winter. And limiting fresh air in the winter time when you need it most is a bad thing to do. When you look at the details of these asthma records, you see that absolutely the incidence of asthma goes up the further north you go. The more we shut our homes and seal ourselves in homes, that uh, asthma increases with increasing latitude. Now this air is drier than the air that we exhausted. This air, when it goes in, and then whatever means is heating it up to comfort conditions, our activities inside, our breathing, our perspiration, cooking, plants, showers, aquariums, these are the things that are increasing moisture that take us up to this level so that then when we exhaust it, we're exhausting that moisture. Looking at an ERV, it's not too much different. Same concept, except with this permeable membrane in the core, allowing moisture vapor to, in this case, come out of the uh, exhaust stream and go into the inlet stream. Instead of being a horizontal line over the dew point and then dropping down, we're going to have a drop of the air's moisture content and a simultaneous increase of moisture content of the fresh air coming in. And in the winter time, in some locations, that can be a benefit because the net effect is that then, as you look at this level of humidity coming in the, uh, into the house, that the amount of moisture we add to it doesn't have to be so great to get up to a range that some people find more comfortable. What we generally find, though, is that our activities coupled with not uh, actively trying to add moisture or humidity to the air is sufficient for keeping this new class of high performance homes at say 40% or so humidity. Um, so this is typically what a, an ERV would look like in contrast to, to an HRV. Now let's look on uh, the, the hot weather side of things. With an HRV, um, let's say we're over in this range, most people set their thermostats up and that Vermont report that I mentioned uh, has all the details of comfort conditioning in those homes and you can see how people seasonally uh, change their indoor temperature level in the summer um, from that of the winter. And so uh, say around 74, 76 degree for an indoor temperature and, uh, and maybe around 50 to 60 percent humidity would be typical of many of these homes. As it goes through the HRV, because it's not exchanging moisture, it's a horizontal movement, and so the air we're exhausting warms up as it picks up heat from the outside air, the fresh air coming in. And again, this is a horizontal line because it's not adding or losing moisture. And so the air coming in will be typically at a moisture content that's not desirable, in at least in humid regions. And it will also not be at a comfortable temperature. So additional comfort uh, conditioning will have to be done to that air. When we look at an ERV, it's quite interesting. 
because in an ERV, as we exhaust air from the house, it's going to be increasing the moisture content. If the outdoor air is higher humidity, so as the outdoor air is cooling and losing some moisture to the indoor air as it's exhausting, there's a slight benefit over the HRV that just dropped in temperature but didn't lose any moisture. It's very dependent on the weather, where you're located, the house you're in, the moisture you generate in your house, but it's also dependent on the location of where you take air from your house. And this, uh, this reference eight, which is a report by Building Sciences Corporation, uh, Joe Stabrook, for those of you who know him and his colleagues at Building Sciences, a report that they uh, conducted for the National Renewable Energy Lab, NREL, and it studied a number of humidity control systems in Houston over an extended period of one to two years. And they actually found that the ERV outfitted homes perform more poorly than the other homes that they were uh, that they were examining. And unfortunately, this study was run before the CERV came out on the market three years ago. Um, this study was done about six, uh, ten years ago. But the reason why the ERV homes did not perform so well is that the place where we generally exhaust these homes is from the bathrooms, the laundry room, the kitchen. The humidity in a bathroom after a shower is quite high, maybe 100%. And so instead of being at this humidity level being exhausted, which could then have the advantage of lowering the humidity of the incoming air, if you're exhausting air from a bathroom that's 100%, you're instead going to be putting, taking moisture out of that air with an ERV and putting that into your outdoor air that's coming in. So you actually end up with uh, uh, an energy detriment. Now with HRVs and ERVs having these different characteristics, if you do a computer simulation of their performance throughout the country, and, uh, and I'm just showing a rough line here for a 2,000 square foot home that we modeled in our Zeros uh, house simulation model. And Zeros incidentally is uh, free software that we have online and any of you who are interested in being able to model homes, um, just let us know and we can give you that link. There's no cost to use it. And uh, it's a very powerful model that will let you look at ERVs, HRVs, as well as the CERV, heat pump water heaters, and, and other such devices. Um, this is roughly where the boundary would be. ERVs, tend, on an energy basis, tend to edge out HRVs on the Pacific Coast region of California. ERVs also in the, uh, the southern states, but this is based on the ideal mixture of a house and not the, the study in Houston where uh, the practical side seemed to indicate otherwise. And then HRVs have a, a bit better energy performance throughout the rest of the country. Now let's go on to air quality and, and look at how the CERV compares to ERV and HRV performance. The one thing about ERVs and HRVs is that at least most of them to date do not sense CO2 VOCs, or other factors that are impacting air quality. You simply set a dial and hope you've set it at a level that is good enough. The problem is that the level of quality we need for our health, our cognition, our sleep, our productivity is at a level that our nose cannot smell. By the time your nose smells something, it's too late. Your air quality is not good. And, and this is why we need sensors, today's technology, in order to, in order to manage our air quality. Let's look at two plots. Uh, the one plot on top is from a passive house, a very nice home, very low energy home, with a typical ERV in it. And uh, the occupants just set the dial based on what smells fine. Uh, I've been to this house, and when I walked in the house, it smelled fine to me. And when I took the data over about a two-week period, you can see here that when I came to the house, um, it was somewhere in this range, and the house smelled fine. 
the, the VOCs were above where you'd like it, and VOCs impact your cognition and health. And then the CO2 was also quite high. And, uh, and over about a week period, it stayed above levels. Uh, we like to see less than 900 ppm maintained in a house. Um, it stayed above those levels until the occupants left for about a week. And uh, they had some friends checking it now and then, so you can see where somebody would come in a bit. But here it's overventilated. There's no need to be blowing that level of air through. And then they came home, and immediately it went back up. But how are they supposed to know? And then the time it requires somebody to manually check and set. Uh, that's why we have thermostats. That's why our refrigerators have automatic temperature controls. Let us do other things that are more productive and then let something else manage, uh, manage uh, these other things. So here's a, a house with a serve in it and uh, with CO2 and VOCs. The set point for this house is uh, about 1,000. And as the CO2 and VOCs, here you see a VOC spike probably from cooking. This green band indicates fresh air was brought in and brought down. And, uh, and then throughout this time period, just the general operation of the house, the pollutants weren't so high. But then we hit some points where, uh, uh, now this ventilation might be just because it was nice outside. So we see the pollutants aren't that high. Uh, the serve with smart ventilation knows when it's nicer outside than inside to bring air in. Here we see we get above the set point. So the fan comes on, and this green area is showing fresh air ventilation. Here's probably cooking events, other people coming into the house, but the serve is managing the fresh air, keeping these events under control. And this is a three-day period rather than a two-week period. So if you squish this up to the same scale as up above here, uh, this would be even less of an amount of time where these spikes uh, exceeded things. And then you can see where here the air quality is bouncing around at the set point. And then things settle down and drop down. So there may have been people staying in the house here, pushing it up against the set point limit. We do a lot of things that in our design that we could do better to lower the source contamination. We uh, put vents in floors, which should not be done. Here you see my foot. And I can guarantee you, you don't want to smell what's coming up through the floor of my past my foot. And then you see some heating cooling coils in here. And then some little critters been in there having a nice meal while sitting on top of these heating fins. And uh, uh, as Florence Nightingale knew back in the 1850s that uh, fresh air and ventilation are essential for not getting sick. And just another more modern day. Uh, this article on lumber to liquidators, a quick way to drive a company toward bankruptcy is to have a product that isn't what they said it is. So they're low, no VOC flooring material that, in fact, was just sopping with formaldehyde. The CDC is saying that the risk of cancer in these homes is quite high. And uh, But how are you going to know that? They, if they tell you that it has a certain level, Smart ventilation sensors let you let you identify that. So that's what put us on the track of trying to come up with a better way so that we have one solution throughout all the climatic zones that's energy efficient and has the smarts to automatically control our air quality. And what you see here are simulations of an ERV, an HRV, and a SERV for these different climatic regions throughout the country. And here you can roughly see how the energy is for each of these. Here the HRV in Portland is a little better than an ERV, and the serve is better than both. Here's Denver. You get to uh, our area and HRV, ERV, between the two you can pick either. Here Atlanta, uh, the ERV better than the HRV, but still the serve uh, a bit lower energy. Burlington, Vermont. El Paso, Texas. So we wanted a solution where you didn't have to try to figure out in this part of the country with this kind of construction, this type of house, this type of occupants, what's going to be best. And so between our heat pump 
technology, which is in this lower module that manages the, uh, uh, the energy exchange between the outgoing and incoming stream, the controls and smart algorithms uh, that then see when it's nicer outside or when you need to bring fresh air in, and then when you don't, to not bring it in. The internet controls, what we call service, for regions and for applications where someone would like an extra boost to the serves heating and cooling capacity, as well as its efficiency, a soil heat exchanger. And uh, next, uh, next month's newsletter is going to have an article uh, as we completed a year of extensive experimental tests as well as computer simulations on the performance of these type of systems with a serve zoning, uh, and then uh, distributed HVAC control. Also in our upcoming newsletter will be the release of a new product we call Serve IR that manages uh, many split heat pumps um, through the Serve. And then uh, Serve analytics, and then finally a very, very powerful feature, what we call over-the-air upgrading, which basically means that we can add new features to the Serve at any time as we continue to to develop them. So a serve never goes out of date. Now when you add uh, a serve with homes from these large 4,000 square foot homes to homes such as this uh, manufactured home in Vermont, 500 to 1,000 square feet, to homes of all shapes and climatic zones, you get the best energy efficiency with the best air quality. Um, on serve controls, the main serve control screen, and you can see a live screen from Equinox House on our website. You can click through all of the screen's control options. You just can't implement those control selections. Uh, otherwise, uh, my wife wouldn't be happy if you were playing with our set points. But you can see data directly from our house over uh, the past week, over the past year. This new product I mentioned, Serve IR, is just a little box that sends infrared signals from the serve over to a mini split heat pump. And uh, you can control multiple mini splits with this device. And uh, basically it turns a dumb mini split heat pump into a, a smart conditioning system. And, uh, and then we have uh, wireless communication through various devices. And Ocean, Zigbee, and Wi-Fi are the main ones that are incorporated. So let's look at what a serve does that's, that's different. Uh, in cold weather, the serve loves moisture and it loves freezing water on the coils because that's energy. As we condense water out of the air, as we freeze it on the coils, that condensation is heat that we're putting into this airstream that's going into the house. Now this airstream, because we don't add any water from the exiting water from the house, it stays along the same humidity line. And then as a heat pump, because we are extracting uh, heat from the air being exhausted, plus we get the heat, uh, the electrical power driving the inverter drive compressor, that we're going to deliver comfortable temperatures on average to a home, even in very, very cold weather. And so this air delivered to a room is not going to drag a room down in comfort it uh, most likely will help maintain the comfort of that room throughout the winter and throughout the summer. And again, the Vermont report shows the details of that operation for, for these 13 different homes in a harsh winter condition. In the summer, when we're exhausting air from the house, it doesn't matter if it's this humidity or this humidity. We're not cross-contaminating our fresh air stream with the humidity we're trying to get out of the house. Instead, we're taking the air we're cooling it down, and then we're hitting dew point, and we're condensing some water out of the air. Uh, perhaps not as much as we'd like overall, but we're getting rid of this amount of water in a beneficial manner, and then we have that much less conditioning to do as far as the rest of the moisture management. The serve will remove about 10 liters of water under humid conditions, say in this range of uh, humidity level, and, uh, and it will uh, remove that moisture. And a typical mini split heat pump like a Mitsubishi or uh, a Daikin uh, Quaternion or, uh, or the New York Hitachi units, these will remove somewhere in the range of about 
70 to 90 pints uh, of water per day. Compared to the serve, we're moving about 20 pints per day. As far as humidity inside the house, um, between an ERV and HRV in the serve, the serve and the HRV actually look quite a bit alike. The main difference shown here is that the serve, because it will bring in excess fresh air when it sees it's nicer outside, that uh, that's what's happening here. You actually get excess fresh air when conditions are quite nice outside, cool evening or during the swing season. Um, now an ERV, as we uh, discuss, has higher humidity in the winter time because of that moisture being recycled re uh, from the exhaust air to the inside air. And at the same time, in the summertime, from, uh, from our simulations and modeling, it's going to be higher for an extended period of time inside your house. Generally, we're trying to control uh, to not exceed about 60% relative humidity indoors during uh, humid summer condition. And you will be at that 60% relative humidity longer with an, HR, with an ERV than you will with an HRV. Uh, so while there may be some benefit here, starting out with more humid air than you would with these, that uh, you're, you're getting it back over here. Now, as I mentioned, the amount of moisture in your activity in the house is what determines what adds to this. And what we generally see in these high performance homes is that they will, um, with occupant activities, cooking, washing, perspiring, uh, uh, that these will take you up to about 40%. But it's very people dependent and house dependent and climate dependent. Um, on, as far as the details of the energy, this 2,000 square foot home in Urbana, very well sealed, very well insulated, basically Equinox house. Uh, and our energy consumption is somewhere in this range. Uh, it's well documented on our website. But with four people in the house, you would use around 8,500 kilowatt hours a year. With two people, around 5,500 to 6,000. And as you look at an HRV or an ERV, a bit higher, maybe 1,000 kilowatt hours versus 500, depending on the number of people. And uh, the conditions for the simulations are showing up here. No frost prevention methods are assumed. And it's also assumed that somebody is controlling the, uh, the ventilator properly. And, uh, and so, um, and so it, it's based on uh, those type of conditions. And so whether or not it is operated properly is you know, something to, uh, to uh, look at. But let's put this in perspective as far as health costs. If 100 million homes, basically all the residences of the US, 100, 125 million residences in the US, if they are reasonably high performance, as we define, less than 10,000 kilowatt hours per residence or about 4,000 kilowatt hours per person uh, per year. 12 cents a kilowatt hour, basically the cost of electricity, solar electricity is uh, significantly less than that now. We'd spend about $160 billion a year for energy for our residences. As I mentioned, half of that's for people, half for climate. Well, relative to the climate dominated, what uh, many of uh, many folks are focused on. We look at influenza. Almost 90 billion dollars a year for endemic influenza, not pandemic, but the influenza that comes through every year. And studies are showing that maybe half of that could be prevented by better ventilation, by better comfort conditioning conditions. So just think of 40 billion dollars, maybe that could be saved by better ventilation. That's a big chunk relative what the potential savings here are with more insulation and, uh, and uh, varying sorts of windows. Uh, on the asthma side of things, 10% of the population, nearly 10% is afflicted with asthma, and the CDC shows that $56 billion per year is spent. About 25% of our homes have somebody with asthma at a cost of nearly $1,000 per residence for that asthma. 
through better ventilation, better air quality, we could reduce this back to where it had been. We'd knock off another 25 billion a year, but maybe we can even do better than that. And then human cognition. These recent studies that are contained in these references show that at standard ventilation rates for a building, we're losing about one and a half trillion dollars per year in cognition productivity, a, a, a huge amount. And just to give you an idea, using uh, background information from these references, if we go from what's today's standard, roughly about 1,100 ppm, to somewhere in the 7 to 800 range, that would be a human productivity gain of four to five thousand dollars, triggering a human's worth about fifty thousand dollars a year. And uh, whether it's a child trying to study effectively at home uh, and trying to be healthy. Uh, versus somebody who needs to be healthy at home in order to be productive at work. Um, this is roughly the dollar range of that cognition gain relative to a fairly low expense per person to improve the ventilation to these levels with a serve somewhere in the range of 40 to 50 bucks a year. Finally, as far as the serves operation, um, uh, this is a house, uh, a new house that was built um, uh, a few years ago and this home here's the CO2 levels and you can see the VOC levels as they were getting ready to move in were going crazy well they found out that the gas clothes dryer as much as we encourage them not to have natural gas in their home uh, that had a leak once they fix the leak then you see a more typical pattern of CO2 and VOCs uh, interweaving through the house I'm going to end on uh, this note. We don't look at the serve as just a ventilator, just a couple of fans in a box that blow through. Uh, our mission is to make ourselves, uh, Ben, Alex, and myself, as well as you, healthy and comfortable. And everything we can do in order to do that, that's, that's our mission. So as far as the serve and service, and these days of big data, these days of cloud-based computing and that, as much as it can have a dark side to it, the beneficial side is that we are going to be healthier and, and, and do that with less resources. Serve operation through this service um, that improved algorithms, diagnostics to see uh, what the problem is, archive data so uh, folks can take a look at what's been happy in your, their house and why, why are VOCs high. What might they do to, uh, to reduce them? But then mixing that with things like outdoor pollution, um, we're going to be getting finer and finer grain local outdoor pollution information to help guide us. Biometrics, our Fitbits and activity trackers, but our serve analytics. What's been our exposure to pollutants over time? And then our home systems to interface effectively with a heat pump water heater, it's cooling your house down, which is a benefit in the summer, a detriment in the winter, but it's still always a positive benefit to the ways we've heated water. Heat pump clothes dryers are coming in, and then other systems that interact with air quality and the energy being moved around the house to keep us comfortable. And then finally, big data. Yes, uh, there are a bunch of creeps that will do crappy things with this, and we always need to be watching for them but there's good things that can happen. As my data is collected, as others in the CERV community's data is collected, we can figure out what's making us sick, what causes a sinus attack, a migraine headache, what causes, uh, what might be used to mitigate uh, a time of depression or, uh, or uh, prevent an onset, uh, an asthma attack. This is where we're going, this is where we're here. And, uh, and as I mentioned, we have, uh, uh, we have a, uh, a webinar on our new analytics, our new IQ metrics, and we hope you'll join us when, when that one's offered, probably in the first of the new year. So finally, let's end on a positive note. Uh, we have the resources to do things efficiently in a sustainable manner, and, uh, and, it's, and the economics are pointing in the direction that we can do these things now. Uh, we don't have to wait for someone to do them for us. We don't have to wait for a program or for some type of uh, uh, 
other uh, incentives to drive this. Individually, we can do this. When you're building a home, you're choosing a home for the next 100 years. Let's make sure that those next generations in these homes are going to be healthy and comfortable so that they can create a future for the next generation beyond them. Uh, thank you very much for participation. I'm sorry I went on so long. I didn't intend to go quite this long. Here's this list of uh, references. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff in here, and these lead to a lot of other uh, good references. And again, please send us your questions. We're more than happy to answer them. Um, and, and let us know how I can improve this. Um, uh, I know I need to streamline it, but, but any of your guidance is appreciated. Thank you very much.